This red line is caused by a bad PCB layout. The green line is what it's supposed to be. I'm going to show you some very simple rules to understand unwanted behavior of your PCB layouts so you can prevent something like this from happening. I'll prove those rules with actual measurements. So let's have a look what the fundamental issue is. When you enter a schematic, you're assuming ideal wires and connections. I mean, these things are basically superconductors. However, when you turn it into a layout, these ideal connections are basically turned into copper strips. These copper strips have a resistance, an inductance, and a capacitance to any other piece of copper on the board. So let's assume we can extract all these parasitics perfectly, and then basically turn them into the real schematic with parasitics. You will find that the original schematic and the real schematic can look really different. So what is your job as an electronics engineer? You have to minimize this. And this is what I'm going to try to show you in this video. So in order to minimize these parasitics, you'll need to understand the relationship between the layout that you're making and the parasitic resistance, inductance and capacitance it creates. This can be done with a few rules of thumb and understanding where current runs in a layout. It must be said that it is not easy to determine the exact values of these parasitics in the layout, but it is quite easy to determine which one is best, so you can choose that best solution. So the first thing we'll look at is where current is running in the layout. Now the first thing you have to understand is that current flows in loops. So what do I mean by that? What you see here is a schematic of a connector. It's a little bit more clear on the layout here. This is a standard SMA connector with four ground connections and a signal line. So there's a, a voltage applied to this connector and the current will run like this, go to the load resistor and return via the ground connection. Now this, signal, this current running here is called the, the forward current or the signal current and the current going through the ground is usually called the ground or return current. So it's good to realize that current always runs in a loop like this. Now what you see here is that the return current has two options. Now in the schematic, of course, all these lines are ideal, so it doesn't make any difference. However, if you look at the layout, uh, which is made of real copper, there is a clear difference in where the current is going to run. So at low frequencies, so let's say DC, the current will follow basically the resistance ratio. Now we have one path here and a second path here. Now if you roughly look at this, then you can say, okay, this path is uh, half the length of this path. So this, these traces will have a resistance and the resistance of this trace for DC will be twice as much as the resistance of this tra trace. So two thirds of the current is gonna run here at DC and one third is going to run here. Now when you go to high frequencies, something different is going to happen. Then the inductance starts to become dominant. Now, how do you calculate inductance in this way or, or get an idea of it? It's basically the size of the loop. So if the current follows this forward path and this return path, you can see it's a very small loop compared to this path. So what you will notice is that at high frequency, most of the current is going to run through this line. So basically the rule of thumb here is, if you offer a shorter path, it will have a lower impedance basically for all frequencies. That's what we can conclude from here. Now there's a much better way for the return current and that is a ground plane. And that's what we're gonna look at next. So what is a ground plane? A ground plane is a plate of copper covering an entire layer of a board. So on the left bottom, you can see it here. The blue layer is the bottom layer of the board. The red layer is the top layer. And you can see that the entire surface area of the board of the bottom layer is used to make a, a copper plane. Now on the schematic, you see that we use uh, ground symbols now, which is normal. So the basic advantage is ground is now everywhere available on your board. You just place a via and you can connect to the ground. So the advantage is that you always have the shortest path available to ground. And the return current can choose where it goes. Now it can choose to go here, the long way, but that'll have a lot of inductance. So it will choose the path right under the signal path because that has the lowest possible inductance. It has the lowest possible surface area of this loop. This effect of course increases with frequency because as the frequency gets higher, the inductance created by this loop will have a bigger and bigger impact. 
So let's talk about impedance of copper on a PCB. There are a few very simple rules of thumb you can follow here. Tin traces have an inductance of one nanohari per millimeter. So you, if, if you have a, a very thin trace, say 0.2 millimeters, and it's 10 millimeters long, then you've got roughly 10 nanohari. Mm -hmm. Now the wider a trace is, the lower the resistance and inductance. So the impedance is lower. Now resistance is logical because yeah, you get more copper, so less DC resistance. Inductance may be a little bit less intuitive, but the surface area determines the inductance, is what I've always been taught. So a plane, you could basically see a plane as a very wide trace, has the lowest possible impedance. That's why it's so incredibly useful to use it for grounding, because you will create the best possible ground you can make. So another thing we need to be able to estimate is the value of capacitance. Now, a capacitor is basically two conducting plates with an isolator in between. Now, in a capacitor, the isolator is usually called a dielectric. So it's good to know what drives the value. So if the surface area between the plates gets bigger, you get more capacitance. So if you make these plates bigger, the value increases. If the distance between those plates gets smaller, you get more capacitance. If you make it larger, you get less capacitance. Now another impact is the, the dielectric constant of the isolator that's between those plates. The higher the dielectric constant, the more capacitance you get. Now air has a dielectric constant of 1, and FR4, which is a standard PCB material, has a dielectric constant of 4.7. So that would yield a 4.7 times larger capacitor. So let's have a look at an example. Let's assume we have this uh, board cross section here. So you have two traces on the top layer of a board and on the bottom layer you have a ground plane. And you want to know which is bigger, the capacitance from this trace to ground or between these two traces. Now, let's go through the three uh, factors that impact this. So the area between trace and ground is much larger than the area between these two traces. That's just this tiny little piece of copper. The distance between trace and ground is much smaller than the distance between these two traces. So that makes this capacitance much bigger than this one. And thirdly, the dielectric constant between this trace and ground is 4.7 and between this trace and this trace is 1. So the overall conclusion is that the capacitance between this trace and ground is way, 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 way larger than the capacitance between these two traces. Let's have a look at the first measurement demonstration where I'm going to try to prove that an unobstructed ground plane is very important. So let's have a look at this board design. We have a transmission line that's roughly 10 centimeters long on the top layer. And on the bottom layer, we have an obstruction in the ground plane, which is 24 millimeters long. And uh, a transmission line is basically uh, a coaxial cable, but then on a printed circuit board. Now, the way we're going to measure this is with a network analyzer. I'm using a Nano VNA, which is a fantastic little toy, cost about 400 euros, and uh, it can do network analysis up to 4.4 gigahertz, starting at 50 kilohertz. So we're basically sweeping the gain of this transmission line. Now, we are going to measure the loss of this line with different obstruction sizes. We're, we can completely fill up the plane, so it's ideal. We can put a solder blob directly under the trace, which we talked about. That's where we think the current is going at high frequencies. And so if we put it there, it should give very much the same results as a full plane. And we're going to measure it with a 24 millimeter obstruction. Now, what you notice here is that um, this looks a little bit different from the rest of the board because I had copper here, floating copper, which I removed. This is something for another measurement. I'll get to that later. Here on this layout picture, you still see this floating copper. So I just want to make extra clear what we're doing with this experiment. So let's talk about signal and return current again. So a 50 ohm source is connected to this port and a 50 ohm load is connected to this port and the gain is measured, measured between these two. Now the signal current will run this way. It go from port one to port two and the return current will go through the blue ground plane but it'll hit an obstruction here. So it has to make a detour and then continue. And by placing a solder blob here or by completely covering this in solder, I can do this on the bottom, we can uh, give it its ideal path or a full plane. So these are the measurement results. Now let's explain this graph first. On the y-axis, we see the gain, and this is ranging from zero to minus 20. 
On the x-axis, we see the frequency, which goes from 0 to 4.4 billion, basically 4.4 gigahertz. On the pictures below here, we see the bottom side of the board, and we see different states of the ground obstruction. So here we see a 24 millimeter obstruction. This is original. Here we see a solder blob, exactly under the trace, and here we see a fully covered ground plane. Now the, the measurement results, I find them pretty amazing. They really prove the point I'm trying to make. These two characteristics for this solder blob and this full plane are on top of each other, up to 4.4 gigahertz, which I find amazing. I expected a little bit of difference, but basically if any current would use a wider path through the ground plane, then these characteristics would not have been the same. So this basically proves the current runs only exactly under the signal trace, which is amazing. So what's going on here with this blue trace where we have this 24 millimeter obstruction? Well, basically the ground return current goes through the plane, hits this obstruction and has to go around. It probably goes around in both directions because I've placed this exactly centered around the trace on the other side of the board. So basically we've created a loop and a loop is an inductance. So this inductance causes loss, what you see here. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated. You will actually get a resonance on here and this thing resonates at four gigahertz. Now, what does this mean? You've built a four gigahertz antenna and this antenna transmits and receives. So you are losing your signal. You're sending it out onto the, into the world and you're suddenly susceptible to interference, which can come into your signal line. So this is a disaster. So this is the reason why you shouldn't have any obstructions in your ground plane. Now there's another interesting thing to, to note uh, about interference coming in. When you have an analog channel, like an FM or DAP antenna input or GPS antenna input or a microphone input, these channels usually have a dynamic range of about 120 dBs. That's pretty normal. It's sometimes even more. It can go up to 130, 140 decibels. Now the problem is that's a ratio of 1 to 10 million. So even the slightest interference that comes in will ruin the bottom end of your dynamic range. So that is why it's so important to have a ground plane without obstructions. That is the best defense against all these problems. So this is rule number one. Make sure you have a ground plane without obstructions. Otherwise I'm gonna come and find you. As I've mentioned before, I've been designing analog layouts for over 30 years. And during that time, I have encountered a lot of mistakes. I kept track of those mistakes and made a list of how to prevent them. I use this list for all my designs and it almost always helped me find a few small errors. If you want to benefit from 30 years of mistakes as well, then please leave a comment below saying, send me the checklist, then I'll get you a free copy. So there's something else I wanted to show you. Microstrip loss calculations are extremely accurate. So what you see here on the screen is a loss calculator from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You basically fill in all the information here uh, about the, the transmission line and you fill in all the parameters of the material and then you calculate the output and look at the loss, 1.68, 1.69 around it and what I actually measure is 1.67. So I'm completely stunned by the accuracy of not only this simple network analyzer, its calibration, but also the materials here. So this is great. So I mentioned before I would get back to these floating ground planes near the transmission line. So what you see here is the loss of the transmission line with and without these floating ground planes. Now the red line has these floating ground planes and the blue line hasn't. So what's going on here? Well, basically, the signal is traveling along this transmission line. There's capacitive coupling towards these, these planes, these floating planes. So these planes will actually pick up this wave, this signal, and the signal will basically move across the plane and bounce back. So it starts bouncing around and also on this side. Now, because of this, you get resonances and that causes these, these deep peaks. You see that it's a pretty big effect at 3.7 gigahertz. You lose 90 dB just because of these, or almost 90 dB, just because of these floating planes. So if you're doing RF circuitry, be very careful about floating planes. Now there are a few things you can do. You can either remove them 
or you can hammer them to the ground with a number of vias and you would like, would like to place them quite regularly at least every quarter wavelength, preferably every tenth of a wavelength of the signal that you want to use this transmission line on. Um, if you do that, if you ground it, you will change the impedance of this transmission line. So you should look up a transmission line calculator to fix that. That's more something for another video, but I just wanted to mention it here. In this video, I've shown you basic rules of thumb to estimate the parasitics in the board and the importance of ground planes. In the next video, I'll show you how to use layer stackups and vias to get the most out of your board design. I'm also really curious to know if there are any subjects in electronics that you're struggling with. Maybe this is something I can address in a YouTube video and maybe make a course on later. Let me know in the comments and see you next time.